Next we have uh, open simple prostatectomy. Dr. Ganesh Gopalakrishnan requires no introduction. He is uh, past president of our Urology Society of India and also previously HOD from well-known Christian Medical College, Vellore. His students have become head of, head of the department in throughout the world in different parts. And uh, now Dr. Ganesh Gopalakrishnan is going to highlight us on open simple prostatectomy, one of the technique which uh, most of us were not familiar, except especially me. And um, welcome, Ganesha. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Anand, and to the ITRU group for the invitation. I was a little intrigued as to why you have, uh, sorry, I was a little intrigued as to why you have uh, asked me to speak on open prostatectomy. Maybe because of my age or is it because this is really an operation which is being phased out in, uh, in the world? <laughs> I do understand that uh, the open prostate is, is something that uh, many people are shy about. And it's an operation which the anesthetist is terribly scared about. Because even before you made the incision, he's already connected the blood bottle. I don't know where they get this uh, uh, idea that this is uh, necessary. But anyway, it has always been known as an operation which is very bloody. And uh, it's very nice to see some of the old AUA videos, which were one, the unedited version, and the other edited version by <coughs> by Ralph, uh, by sorry, uh, I can't get into Ralph Klamer. And uh, these, these are very interesting videos which are worth watching in the AUA library. So it, it gives you an idea as to what open prostatectomy. I actually don't like the word simple because there's no operation in, in the world which is actually simple. Even a circumcision can actually give rise to a problem. So the only disclosure I have to make is that I've got some of these line diagrams which I've taken from Blandy's third edition. I think they're very illustrative. And that's the disclosure that I have to make. <clears throat> what about the history of uh, uh, open prostatectomy? Whenever, there is, whenever people talk about history in surgery, the rights are claimed by many because one really doesn't know uh, which side of the Atlantic or which side of the Pacific you, you are residing from. But in 1885-87, Belfield uh, from Cook County in Chicago has been uh, noted to have done the first open prostatectomy. Sir, you can but share the screen, reason... sir. Sorry? You can share the screens, please. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Yes, sir, we can see now. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, but we are more familiar with, uh, with three names in, in our generation. And that is uh, Sir Peter Freya, who actually showed us the suprapubic root. Uh, Terence Millen, who showed us the retropubic root. And Hugh Hampton Young from across the Atlantic in the United States, who first did the perineal root. Uh, my own experience has been with the, both the suprapubic as well as the retropubic root, and personally I have not done any through the perineum, and this requires a certain degree of e uh, expertise and also uh, specific instrumentation which is necessary as far as this operation is concerned. <clears throat> uh, I just want to dwell a little bit on the anatomy relevant to the procedure. This is purely an extra peritoneal procedure done through the retropubic space. And even if you've gone many times into the retropubic space, one does identify the bladder by the veins which are coursing over its surface. And one can identify the bladder neck by use of a Foley balloon and hitch the Foley balloon, inflated Foley balloon on the bladder neck and you can feel that. Or sometimes even if you don't have a Foley balloon, you can actually make out a transverse ridge, uh, which you can actually see sometimes when you do a radical prostatectomy. Distal to the bladder neck is the anterior surface of the prostatic capsule. And there again, you have some veins which are coursing over the dorsal vein, etc., coursing over the anterior surface of the prostate. Now, this anatomy is fairly consistent. There may be some variations in the, in the number of veins. Sometimes they'll be very one, sometimes they'll be two or three, or sometimes they can be uh, a mesh of veins which you have to take care of during the procedure. What are the indications? There is really... <laughs> Nothing to say that uh, this is the indication for uh, an open prostatectomy. But one thing is very clear. The larger the prostate, the better the operation. Uh, one tries to 
do an open prostatectomy for smaller operate for smaller size glands and i think you land up with bladder neck stenosis and other issues the larger the gland the more easy the planes for a nucleation and uh, sometimes you can go to 80 some people say 100 some people say 250 grams uh, it actually depends between you and your what your abilities are uh, there is no harm in doing a two stage uh, operation especially a turp i guess today these are all relegated to the back bench and unless you have a very large prostate with bladder calcula and you think you're going to take a long time maybe you could do an open prostatectomy for him uh, if you have a very long urethra some people feel that the resectoscope cannot reach of course you do have extra long resectoscopes this is a relative indication and if you do have a standard resectoscope and a very large prostate you can still get away with a turp or a hole through a perineal urethrostomy so you know really the indications for an open prostatectomy or if we want to show it to a resident today, and in, in my own uh, institution right now, we probably do one or maybe two in a year, uh, very large prostates exceeding about 200 grams. And uh, it, it just makes it easier and the resident can actually see uh, what a prostate looks like and how an open prostate should be done. The approaches are suprapubic, retropubic, and the perineal. And for the purposes of today's discussion, I'll leave out the perineal approach. Uh, what about the intraop preparation? Usually, most of these patients are in the supine position. In some of the patients who have a very large prostate, uh, and if you've got some short fingers or you've got podgy hands, uh, Lloyd Davis' uh, position is quite good actually with these Allen stirrups because this gives the opportunity for a third assistant to be between the legs of the patient and put a finger into the rectum and elevate the prostate into the into the wound, and this makes it easier sometimes and very obese patients or very uh, patients with a very, very large prostate. Uh, preliminary cystoscopy is necessary uh, because you want to make sure that there's nothing inside the bladder. I know that in today's world, you would have done all the investigations to make sure, but uh, when you're doing a retropubic approach, you hardly look into the bladder. So it's a good idea to actually do a cystoscopy and assess again. After all, we are urologists and we always have the cystoscope handy with us in the operation room. Uh, you like to catheterize and keep the pa keep the catheter in the operative field so that you have it sterile and you can uh, you can actually take it out or put it back in whenever you want to. A fan style or an infra umbilical vertical incision, and if you're using the if you're doing the first procedure, you tend to keep the bladder a bit distended so that you can identify the planes and uh, get to the bladder easily. If you're planning a Millen's procedure, then you like to keep the bladder empty so that you don't have the bladder coming in the way of the prostatic capsule and the symphysis pubis. These are some of the veins that need to be ligated over the prostatic capsule if you're doing a retropubic approach. But if you're doing a, a, a Freyer's procedure, you don't need to bother about those veins. You open the bladder vertically, preferably, and then using a diathermy, you go around the prostate on the edge of the bladder neck as is shown in this diagram. Mind you, the ureteric orifices have to be very carefully preserved and you've got to make sure that the ureteric orifices are not in any way compromised as a result of the nucleation. Now, one of the things about the Freya's operation is that although it is an open operation, the entire enucleation is done virtually blind. And you can find the surgeons looking at the right and left and you know going around in a trance trying to enucleate a large prostate. But it's one of those operations which, if done well, gives a very clean and elegant looking prosthetic fossa. So this is how the enucleation is done. You put your finger, index finger in through the bladder neck and you actually split the anterior commissure, quite like what Tanun showed with the laser. You just split that commissure, it's quite thin. And then once you split the commissure, you get the planes on either side. And this is where a large prostate helps because the planes are quite nice and you have that false capsule going right around the prostate. And then when you enucleate the prostate, you have a fossa which is empty like this. And you've got the blood vessels and you will take these hemostatic sutures with the uh, Vicryl 3-0 or 2-0, whatever is your convenience. If you want cat gut, you can use cat gut. And these are fairly well localized to the 5 and 7 o'clock and anteriorly too. So you could actually uh, ligate these vessels and this will reduce the amount of bleeding uh, at the level, at the, into the prosthetic fossa. When you want to do a retropubic enucleation, you don't open the bladder at all. You make the incision over the prosthetic capsule. I showed you the figure, the first figure where the veins were. You just make a transverse incision 
usually over the prostatic capsule. Some people make a vertical incision which goes over the bladder neck too. But uh, most of us would probably do a transverse incision over the prostatic capsule. And this would get you right into the prostate. And you'll be seeing the prostate as you see it here. And then you will be able to then again split it and enucleate the prostate. And actually once you take the prostate out, as you can see the strip of the urethral mucosa, as is clearly shown in this picture. The diathermy needle is quite useful, uh, even the scissors. And if you have a plane, you can actually use a scissors or even a diathermy scissors to aid your dissection. In most situations, the strip that is across uh, the between the veru and the bladder neck, you'd like to preserve that uh, strip of urothelium, but in many situations, it does, doesn't work. It just comes off along with the rest of the prostate and you're left with the fossa and the verum montanum distally. One of the things, this is how the prostatic factor uh, looks. If you can get that mucosal strip after the nucleation, it's quite nice because it is useful uh, and helps in regeneration and re-epithelialization of the prostatic capsule, of the prostatic fossa. Uh, if you don't, then you can, you can use this mucosal strip to do what's called re-trigonization. Uh, this is a procedure that's part and parcel of a retropubic prostatectomy or even an open prostatectomy. You want to line that prostatic fossa with a bit of urothelium. Even if you do a Freyer's prostatectomy, you've got the bladder neck, uh, uh, you've got the mucosa at the level of the bladder neck, and that can be stitched onto the prostatic fossa. Or if you've done a retropubic uh, retrigonization, this is what is done. And this actually helps in, uh, as I said, in healing. And uh, if you do have a narrow bladder neck, and then you can just do a bladder neck incision at the same time, or a wedge resection of the bladder neck uh, using an Alice forceps and take a wedge out. Uh, this happens only if you have done it by mistake in a small prostate. But in large prostates, you don't need to do this, and you probably just have to do the retragonization. Uh, after the nucleation, what do you do? You check again for hemostasis. I think having a bipolar diathermy is very useful here, and you can actually take care of all the uh, bleeders. As soon as you've done the enucleation, one usually uh, puts a pack into the prosthetic fossa and you twiddle your thumbs for five minutes by the clock and just make sure that you know, you're doing nothing at this time. Don't be in a hurry to take that pack off. It does help the prosthetic capsule shrinks and just like after TRP it shrinks, it shrinks here and the bleeding gets arrested. At this time, you must ask the anesthetist what the blood pressure is because you know, um, sometimes it can get a little low and uh, you want to make sure that the BP is in the three-figure mark so that you're sure that there's no spurter which can give you trouble later on. Invariably, many of these patients have a spinal or some patients, they have an, a general anesthetic, then sometimes the blood pressure can shoot up post-operatively and some of these things start to bleed. Once you pack the fossa and you wait for five minutes, you take the pack out and uh, you make sure that there are no strips of gauze or anything left inside that fossa because any foreign body left in this large fossa is a sure recipe for vesicle calculus or prosthetic calculi. So you do a bipolar coagulation of any bleeders in the fossa. I know one of the surgeons who actually, after a prostatectomy, if he's put the patient in lithotomy, that's why he puts the patient in lithotomy, he puts a resectoscope in and uh, fulgurates the bleeders using the resectoscope. I saw this at one of the workshops and I thought it was a very interesting way to arrest bleeding. Make sure that the two ureteric orifices are intact and check for reflux. Ask the anesthetist to give him a, a small dose of uh, a diuretic furosemide. See the efflux. Satisfy yourself that you've not actually compromised the orifices. And put a large three-bay catheter inside. A 20 French or a 22 French Foley catheter would be fine. Uh, inflate the balloon and apply mild traction. And continuous bladder irrigation is initiated. Uh, while actually the prosthetic fossa is being closed if you do a retropubic or if the bladder is being closed if you do a suprapubic. Uh, you check for leaks uh, from the bladder wall or from the prosthetic capsule once you've done the operation. You put a drain. I would say that a suprapubic catheter is optional. I don't put a suprapubic catheter since I have got a three-way Foley catheter and I've got good hemostasis. This is usually sufficient in the vast majority of patients. So what are the complications? I think a well done open prostatectomy is a wonderful operation still. Uh, it's a feel good factor when you left the OR that you left really nothing at all uh, compared to sometimes when you have some bits of adenoma sticking here and there with some of the other techniques, there is really a clean fossa here. The fact that it is being replicated robotically speaks for itself that this is a good operation. The next speaker is going to talk to us about the same operation being done 
robotically. So, you know, there is a role for this operation. I don't think the complications of open prostatectomy are any different from the minimally invasive tech procedures. You can have a TURP bleeding, a whole left bleeding, uh, a stricture. All these are there, incontinence, every one of these operations, except the fact that it has a slightly longer hospital stay. Uh, but, you know, uh, within four or five days, you can actually send the patients home with a catheter and they can come back and have their catheters removed as an outpatient. So, uh, really, it, it all depends on how you manage these patients and how you have counseled them before the operation that makes it uh, a big success. So what about the future? Uh, I think this operation does have a role uh, in very large prostates maybe. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the next 20 years, whether we will actually see all these minimally invasive techniques being thrown out and have a drug which surely and surely will actually prevent the prostate from growing at the right time. And uh, that's what the future looks like. But before I leave, I need to tell you a story which was doing the rounds when I was in, in Freeman Hospital in Newcastle way back in, in 80. And this was a gentleman who was 65 years old who came in with acute retention and the registrar did a TURP and removed 80 grams of the prostate and the patient was discharged. Two weeks later, the patient came back again with urinary retention and the senior registrar went in and removed another 100 grams uh, transurethrally and the patient was discharged. He came back a month later with retention. This time, the consultant did an open prostate to be removed 150 grams. So you see, there is a role for uh, an open prostatectomy in today's world. And I'm sure that this operation, uh, although it's being slowly relegated to the back bench, uh, is a good operation. Uh, it's a good operation if done well and gives excellent results. And that's why probably people call it the platinum standard still. Thank you very much, Anand, to, and to the iTrue I group uh, for this wonderful session and a great learning experience as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We can say that uh, open prostatectomy is just mimicked by endoscopy in the form of whole lab and also now taken over by the robotic counterparts. Uh, before you leave, I'll have a question from one of our um, uh, attendees. Is there any standardized uh, staging or grading of the prostatic occlusion endoscopically? I know last time uh, in the Tuesday class for the DNB students, we were discussing the grading of trabaculations and uh, various yes. gradings. And you mentioned about the urologic encyclopedia book, isn't it? Yes, I did. The, the, the grading is, is there. It's, it's a book which was written actually by Roger Barnes. Uh, late Roger Barnes was a professor of urology at the Loma Linda University. And uh, he actually wrote this book sitting in my department in the basement, which was at that time in Christian Medical College of Law. And he has dedicated this book actually to all the urologists of India who was struggling at that time to, rec to get this specialty of urology recognized. And Roger Barnes wrote this encyclopedia urology. And uh, in there, he has give the, uh, given us the gradings of the prostate, both the, uh, the PR grading as well as the endoscopic grading of the prostate. And he gauges this from grade one to grade four, uh, depending on whether the lateral lobes are meeting together, whether the medial lobe is sitting there. And this uh, is done by looking from the verumontanum into the bladder and whether you can see the prostate, whether you can see the bladder neck and the posterior wall of the bladder at all. So these are the gradings and I would recommend you to look at that grading in encyclopedia urology, uh, grades one to four. Uh, it's it's, it's quite, quite, quite well written there. So this is the endoscopic grading uh, from Roger Barnes. Yeah. It's a, it's a book very difficult to get. I think uh, the physical book copies present only like four or five copies in India. But, Absolutely, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, there are very few copies left. I don't know whether somebody will have it in Loma Linda because I'm sure it must be somewhere in some of the archives, at least the AUA library or even in Loma Linda University uh, Medical School. No, after your Tuesday class... We had class, one in our department. We still have it in our department. Yeah. No, after your Loma. Tuesday class, I uh, located a book in the Amazon uh, website it is sold for fifty dollars, and um, really? so so it comes oh. on and off. People are selling their old books like paperbacks, and um, so uh, I've uh -huh. ordered it on Tuesday evening. Right, very good. Thank you. Thank very you much. for the information. We'll pass it on to everybody. Yeah.